In this video, we want to talk about the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. The Fundamental Theorem of Calculus usually is stated in two parts, and one of those parts we've already seen. It's what we were calling the Evaluation Theorem. What does the Evaluation Theorem say? Let's just remind ourselves. So the Evaluation Theorem says that if little f is a function, and if it is continuous on the closed interval from a to b, and furthermore, if capital F is an antiderivative of little f on this same interval, then, if you want to evaluate a definite integral from a to b of little f of x dx, you can do so by means of the antiderivative. Namely, this definite integral is the net change in capital F, f of b minus f of a. This is what we're calling the evaluation theorem, and this is one part of the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. Well, what's the other part? Well, the other part addresses a question which the first part here sort of suggests, but doesn't do so explicitly. Let's look at the statement of the evaluation theorem. It says that if f is continuous, and if capital F is an antiderivative of f, then you can evaluate the definite integral in this way. But it leaves a very important question unasked. That question is, how do you know? How do you, you know when little f that's little f, not capital F. How do you know when little f even has an antiderivative? That's something which isn't explained in the evaluation theorem. The evaluation theorem tells you how to evaluate a definite integral, provided you already have an antiderivative lying around. But how do you know that there is an antiderivative that you can use? Well, that's the other part of the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. Theorem. How do we know when little f has an antiderivative? Well, the answer ends up being pretty straightforward. If little f is continuous, on a closed interval from a to b, then it has an antiderivative there. Then it has an antiderivative, which we normally call capital F, on the interval from a to b. Now, in fact, if you have one antiderivative, you can always add a plus c to it and get another. But the important statement here is that so long as little f is a continuous function on this closed interval from a to b, it necessarily has an antiderivative. This theorem is too hard for us to prove, so we're not going to. Proof withheld. What we can prove is a consequence of this theorem. And this is what we're going to prove. If f is continuous on this interval from a to b, then the derivative with respect to x of the integral from a to x f of t dt is equal to f of x.
Now notice that here x appears as our upper limit of integration. We're imagining that x is between a and b, but it's just some number. The idea here is that we're going to define a function. So this is a function of x. And if we differentiate that function of x, the claim is that we're going to get little f back. In other words, what that means is this integral from a to x of f of t dt is an antiderivative of little f. Before we were thinking of f as being a function of x, it still is, as you can see here. Here I'm just changing the variable to t, but I'm integrating with respect to t, and I'm integrating from a to x. We're thinking of x as being some number between a and b, and so I'm going to integrate part of the way from a to b. Where I go in that interval depends on what choice of x I pick. So I'm going to pick an x and I'm going to integrate from a to x. We can think about it on a number line, and we can imagine that a is here, and b is over here, and I'm going to pick some x in between. But this x, I can move around. I can make it closer to a or closer to b. I can move it. But once I choose it, I'm fixing an x. And so I'm going to integrate from a to x. But I can't have an x here as well, because x is now no longer a variable. It's a chosen number. So I have to choose a different letter to use as my variable. So I'm using t, which is a common choice, but it's not the only choice. We could have picked s, we could have picked y, we could have picked u. We could have picked any letter that wasn't already being used for something. The problem here was that x was already being used for something. It was being used for this upper limit. Now having said that, once you pick that x, you're going to end up with a number, but it's going to depend on x. And so if it depends on x, it defines a new function of x. That's what we're doing here. We're defining a function of x. And if we differentiate that function of x, we're going to get little f back. So the meaning of this is that the integral from a to x f of t dt defines, excuse me, defines an anti- derivative of our function little f. Well, let's prove this theorem. Now we're actually going to need to use the previous theorem, the one where the proof was withheld because it was too difficult for us to prove, but we're going to use this theorem to prove the consequence. So let's do that. Proof of consequence. We want to show that if we differentiate this integral, we're going to get little f. Now the key idea here is that we're assuming that f is continuous. We assume f is continuous on the interval from a to b. So according to our theorem, the one which we did not prove, since f is continuous on a, b, it has an antiderivative. So let's write that down. Then little f has an antiderivative. Let's call it something. Let's call the antiderivative of little f by the letter capital F, you know, as we usually do. Then what can we say about that? We can say that capital F prime of x is equal to little f of x. Okay, so what's that going to do for us? Well, we're 
going to now differentiate something. We want to differentiate the definite integral which is the integral from a to x f of t dt. We want to differentiate that with respect to x, but the important thing to understand is that this is a definite integral. So we can evaluate this thing, evaluate using the evaluation theorem. The idea here is that you're picking an x, and once you pick an x, that x in the upper limit is just a number. It's a fixed value. So you can integrate this function f of t from a to x, and the output will just be some number, but it will be a number that depends on x. Depends, well, what I want to say is that the value of this thing, value depends on what choice of x you pick. So it's a function of x. But we can evaluate it, and we're going to evaluate it using the evaluation theorem because we know that we have an antiderivative. So by the evaluation theorem, we can say that the definite integral from a to x of little f of t dt is equal to capital F at x minus capital F at a. It's the same evaluation theorem that we're always using, it's just that our upper limit is now x instead of b. It's x instead of b, but that's fine. The evaluation theorem tells you that if you integrate from a lower limit to an upper limit, then you can compute it using the net change in capital F, the antiderivative, looking at the upper limit minus the lower limit. Okay, well that's fine. So what does this tell us? We can now see what the evaluation theorem tells us. It's the net change in capital F, but of course we don't know what capital F looks like. The only thing we know about capital F is what its derivative is. So let's differentiate it. That's our goal anyway. We want to differ differentiate this definite integral. So we differentiate with respect to x, the definite integral from a to x, f of t dt. So this is equal to the derivative with respect to x of capital F at x minus capital F at a. So I'm computing the derivative of a difference. So I can do that as the, deriv the difference of the derivatives. So this is the derivative with respect to x of f at x minus the derivative with respect to x of f of a. Well, the first one here is the derivative of capital F with respect to x. Another way that we write that is capital F prime of x. What about this second term? F at a is a number that does not depend on x in any way. So if you differentiate it with respect to x, you're going to get zero. So what we have here is that the derivative with respect to x of this definite integral, the integral from a to x of f of t dt, is equal to f prime at x. But we know what f prime of x is. It's little f. So it's little f at x. So our conclusion is exactly the thing we wanted to show, that the derivative with respect to x of the integral from a to x f of t dt is equal to little f of x. That is to say, this definite integral with x in the upper limit of integration, this is an antiderivative of little f. Because if I integrate it, well, if I integrate little f of t from a to x, it gives me a new function, and if I differentiate that function, it gives me little f. So in other words, it's an antiderivative of f. So therefore, we can make the following statement. 
if f is continuous on some interval from a to b, then the function capital F defined by capital F of x equals the integral from a to x f of t dt is an antiderivative of little f on the interval from a to b. We can actually say a little bit more than this, because if you have one antiderivative, you actually have them all. So let me make this a remark. The general antiderivative is then given by, well, let's call it g for general, general antiderivative. g of x is equal to the definite integral from a to x, f of t dt, plus some constant. Now, it's very common, actually, to write the c over here, so that way it doesn't accidentally look like it's part of the integral. So oftentimes you'll see it written like this, c plus the integral from a to x, f of t dt. Either way is fine. Uh, the idea is just that sometimes, it, if you're not careful, you might think that this plus c is inside here, where, where it's not. So sometimes people like to put the plus c first. This gives us our general antiderivative, and that's fine, but there's a little thing to observe about this. So note, g of a has a very special property. If we actually try to compute this, what's going to happen? We're going to get this constant plus the definite integral. That's a funny looking definite integral symbol. Let's try that again. There we go. From a to x, but we're, but we're letting x be equal to a here. So that means I put an a in the upper limit of integration f of t dt. But notice here, we have a definite integral from a to a. If you think about what that might mean geometrically, you're looking at the area under the curve, or perhaps above the curve if f is negative, but you're looking at the interval from a to a. Well, there's no area there. So this is just zero. That was actually one of the properties of the definite integral that we saw before. So you just end up with c. So g of a is equal to c. Well, what good does that do us? Well, we've found that g is the general antiderivative. However, it's not just an antiderivative. It's an antiderivative with the property that g of a is equal to c. So if you are looking for a specific antiderivative, so if you're looking for a specific antiderivative, you need only to specify the value of g at x equals a. Well, that is, you need to specify the value of g evaluated at a. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means you're actually giving an initial condition. Saying g of a is equal to some specified value of c is giving an initial condition 
IC, as we normally abbreviate it, to an initial value problem. which of course we normally abbreviate as IVP. So if we put all this together, we can summarize this in the following, well, let's call it a theorem. And we can say that if little f is continuous on an interval the usual interval from A to B, then there is a unique solution to the initial value problem. And let's give the initial value problem. Well, G prime of X is equal to little f of x, and g of a is equal to c. So there's a unique solution to the initial, this initial value problem. And furthermore, that unique solution is g at x is equal to the integral from a to x f of t dt plus c, where this c is the c that's specified in the initial condition of your initial value problem. So what this tells you, what this theorem tells you, is that if you're given a function little f, you can find, you can construct an antiderivative for little f that satisfies a given initial condition. Now notice, we just add that plus c on here because, so note, g of a, this is something we noted before, g of a is the integral from a to a, f of t dt plus c, which is just 0 plus c. So another way of saying that, another way of saying this is the following. If capital F of x is equal to the integral from a to x of little f of t dt, then capital F is the unique antiderivative of little f for which capital F of A is equal to zero. So capital F is an antiderivative, and it's the unique antiderivative of little f for which capital F of A is equal to zero. But once you have one antiderivative, you can get the others by adding in a plus c. And what value do you add in for plus c? Well, it depends on what your initial condition is. It depends on what g is at a. Now, it's kind of important to understand that we can't necessarily evaluate this definite integral at any value of x except for a. It might not be possible to actually evaluate the integral from a to x f of t dt for any value of x other than x equals a. That doesn't mean that the integral won't exist. If little f is continuous on our interval from a to b, or let's say from on our interval from a to x, 
then this definite integral exists. But it might be hard to compute it. It might be hard to compute the exact value. If we know an antiderivative for little f, we can use the evaluation theorem. So if if we know, so if we know an antiderivative, of little f, then we can use the evaluation theorem. to evaluate the definite integral. However, there are some functions that we don't know an antiderivative for. So let's write that down. However, there are some functions that have antiderivatives, but we don't know them. There are some functions with, I want to say, unknown antiderivatives. So as an example, consider the function f at x is equal to sine x squared. This function is continuous everywhere. So this is continuous for all x. However, it doesn't have what we would call an elementary antiderivative. There is no function in terms of sines and cosines or polynomials or exponentials that you can write down so that if you differentiate it, you get sine of x squared. On the other hand, we know that it has an antiderivative. It's continuous for all x, so it has it has an antiderivative. But we cannot write it down in what we call closed form. That means in terms of sines and cosines, polynomials, exponentials, and so on. But it does have an antiderivative. So the only way we can write down, so to speak, an antiderivative is in terms of a definite integral. What do I mean by that? Well, I know that it has an antiderivative, so how do I write it down? Well, I just use this theorem right here. I know that if little f is continuous, then I can construct, I can construct an antiderivative in this way. So, capital F of x is equal to the integral from, let's say, 0 to x sine. I can't, use, I can't put x squared here because I'm using the x there. So, t squared dt. This is an antiderivative. F prime of x is the derivative with respect to x of the integral from 0 to x sine of t squared dt. And this was what we showed in our consequence to our theorem that we couldn't prove. This is exactly equal to sine of x squared. Well, it's not that we couldn't prove it, it's just that we chose not to. So we're able to construct an antiderivative and more to the point, we have a specific antiderivative. 
capital F of x equals the integral from 0 to x sine of t squared dt is an antiderivative for little f of x equals sine x squared, and furthermore, capital F of 0 is 0. So this is a solution to the initial value problem. F, capital F prime of x is equal to sine of x squared, with capital F of 0 equals 0. If I wanted to change this to a different initial value problem, so our new initial value problem will be the integral, not the integral, the derivative of capital F of x is equal to sine of x squared, but f of 0 is equal to 5, just for example, I just picked 5 at random, then what would the solution be? Well, we would know that our solution looks like f of x equals the integral from 0 to x of sine of x squared. Oh, no, we can't have an x squared there. We're already using the x here, so we have to use some other variable. So let's put a t squared there, dt. But here, if I evaluate this at 0, I'm going to get 0. So I just have to add in a plus 5, because now f at 0 is going to be the integral from 0 to 0 sine of t squared dt plus 5. But this is equal to 0. So you just end up with 5. So if you want to solve a differential equation or an initial value problem of this nature for sine of x squared, you're not going to be able to write down some simple expression that gives you the antiderivative. The best you can do is write down an antiderivative in terms of a definite integral. And that's really where this part of the fundamental theorem of calculus comes in. It tells you that yes, an antiderivative does exist, and how do you write it down? You write it down in terms of a definite integral. So let's actually put all of this together, and let's say, let's call this a theorem. Well, we'll call it the fundamental theorem of calculus because that's what it is the fundamental theorem of calculus. And it comes in two parts. So first, our hypothesis is if f is continuous on the interval from a to b, then we can say two things. The first thing that we want to say is that one, yes, f has an antiderivative. Little f has an antiderivative. And we can write it down. Capital F of x equals the integral from a to x of little f of t dt. And Secondly, let me just fix that one, and secondly, that if capital F is any antiderivative of little f on this interval from a to b, then we can use the evaluation theorem. So the integral from a to b of little f of x dx is equal to the net change in the antiderivative, capital F of B minus the capital F of A. And these two collectively give us the fundamental theorem of calculus. The first part is not what we call an existence theorem. It tells us that an antiderivative does exist. The second part tells you what you can do with that antiderivative. So the second one is what you actually use to compute to evaluate definite integrals using the evaluation theorem. But that doesn't do you any good unless you have an antiderivative. And the first one tells you, yes, as long as your function is continuous on AB, it does have an antiderivative. And therefore, you can use the evaluation theorem. Now, using the evaluation theorem 
requires you to possess an antiderivative, which may or may not be easy to find. It really depends on the problem.